This is ContactTalkRadio.com. Consciousness in action. And you are taking action into your consciousness by tuning into Contact Talk Radio. And on TuneIn.com, Hing.fm, and Upsnap Mobile. Contact Talk Radio. When was the last time you felt inspired? Are you ready to take your passions to make a difference while living a life you truly love? Your host, Katana Abbott, who is a life and legacy wealth coach and certified financial planner, searches the world to bring you experts in the field of personal and professional growth, wealth creation, and mind, body, and spirit. So grab a cup of coffee and take that quantum leap you've been waiting for. Smart Women Talk Radio, the link to live with purpose, passion, and prosperity. Thank you so much for coming. This is Katana Abbott. I want to welcome you to another episode of Smart Women Talk Radio, where I search the world for smart women and a few good men, including best-selling authors, thought leaders, and change agents who are on that leading edge. So our topics include things like money, business, health, inspiration, and the metaphysical. So today we are interviewing Dr. Brianna Grogan, um, also known as Dr. Bree. Um, She is a doctor of physical therapy. um, And I don't know if you know this, but to be a physical therapist, you have to have your PhD. Um, And her focus um, is pelvic health. And it's such an important issue and affects women from all different ages. So We're going to talk about why the pelvic floor is the foundation of your inner core. And the biggest misconception about Kegels, those exercises we're told to do, and the secret starting place um, to pelvic rehabilitation and how one simple step can help anyone. So I'd like to tell you a little bit more. I'm going to do Dr. Bree's formal bio here. And um, she is a women's, Dr. Brie is a women's health and nutrition coach, and of course, physical therapist, PhD. And um, she is a YouTube influencer. She has so many fabulous videos there. And she's a podcaster and an author. Her passion is to help people heal themselves naturally through healthful nutrition and safe and effective core fitness. Um, And this holistic way of living will change everything in your body and your life. And it really is contagious. Mm -hmm. So when you eat clean and move every single day, you will shine brighter. And that's what we really want. You know, we're afraid to shine, but when we're feeling great and we're healthy, um, we really do become vibrant and others around you will notice your brilliance. So, um, Dr. Bree, I am so excited to be here today um, with you. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Katana, for having me. I, I'm so excited to talk with you and your audience. Now, we've met um, a couple of times in the past. We, I, I was probably, I, I know for sure we were on a summit together. It may have been Dr. Keisha's summit. But um, we've been on several summits. And then I invited you to be one of our experts in the Smart Women's Academy um, in our Smart Women resource area. And you've got a fabulous program in there. I'm just so thrilled now to be able to come and do a detailed interview with you. So to share you with all of our guests. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm really happy to be here too. Talking about my favorite topic, which is pelvic health and something that nobody ever really really does talk about. I mean, this is something that nobody ever taught us when we were in school or even when we were having kids, if we are parents. Um, This is just, it's very, it's still a taboo subject. And so I'm ready to talk talk about anything that your audience would like to hear. Well, you know, what we'd love to hear first is your story, your journey of coming here. I mean, did you become a physical therapist with this in mind? Or um, is this something that came up? Because I think it's fantastic. You know, I just left um, my physical therapist, by the way. And what I, I think that having a good therapist is one of the most important things we can do. And I have to tell you my story, and then I want you to share yours. But um 
I have had back pain, lower back pain, like my whole life, because I've had scoliosis. And I remember being in a really upscale store trying on all their gorgeous pants back in my 20s. And I kept saying, why is one pant always longer than the other? And they said, ma'am, it's you or miss back then, (laughs) miss, it's you. And I was in such shock. And I realized I had a short boyfriend and he used to wear platforms back in the 70s. And I'd have to stand on my short leg. So I'd be the same height if I stand at a, isn't that terrible? So (laughs) I've had this for years. I've had two knee replacements and I just had a foot surgery. And I'm in my final thing of um, physical therapy. And I was thinking, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to have surgery on my back because the pain is still here. I, this week, my pain has gone from six, seven, eight, nine to like two, three, four. And, and I realized what's happened. I'm finally completely straight. I mean, I can stand in both and I'm this, I'm my hips are level. Mm -hmm. And so I said, can I keep coming back? And she said, no you know, maybe in a couple of months or she goes, the most important thing, this is where I want to go with this. And I didn't realize it. She says, do your exercises that I've shown you and I've got them printed. And she says, those will hold your body in place. And so if for some reason something happens and you go out of whack, you can come back in. But she did different than a chiropractor. She did very interesting, you know, um, relaxing muscles and realigning and just really fine stuff, you know, along with the exercises, but I, I can walk up and down steps. I can do balancing things. I haven't been able to do these. And so I just want to say how important this is. And I, now I understand your, what you, the work that you do even more. Yeah. yeah. So, so anyway, I wanted to have you tell your story about how you got into this. Well, that's I wanted a really... to also share that story. Yeah. Well, first of all, congratulations on your pain level being down so much. That's a huge, huge thing and is life-changing, honestly, because that pain really holds you back. And that is what you described is actually what attracted me to physical therapy as a career in general. Uh, Not only because, you know, I I love moving my body. Like I'm pretty antsy. I don't like to sit for long periods. And so I wanted a career that would get me moving and, and moving with my clients and that kind of thing. But I also love about physical therapy that it doesn't just, you know, put things back into place or, or, you know, put you back into alignment, but it gives you exercises, like you said, so that patients can then be empowered to continue on their own, to keep everything in place. I mean, that's absolutely kind of what we do is we don't just provide a band-aid solution. We fix you and then help you stay fixed (laughs) through exercise and, you know, movement practices. So yeah, really, really cool. And how I came into women's health or pelvic health physical therapy is a bit of a different story. So um, I'll just do the nutshell version. And, And basically I, you know, went to my, I got my doctorate in physical therapy and I started out actually in geriatrics. So I was working in a skilled nursing facility and I had always wanted to work with older people. Um, But to be honest, once I was actually in the career itself, it actually wasn't for me. (laughs) I just, for many reasons, it just wasn't a good fit. And so I got pregnant very early on in my career, pretty much graduated and then had had, uh, got pregnant and I was working in the skilled nursing facility. I was very pregnant. I was just exhausted. I had so much pain and discomfort that I actually was put on not bed rest, but they basically said, you need to stop working pretty, you know, several weeks before I was actually due. They said, you're done. You need to be done. This job is actually too intense for you right now. Um, and so I, I had my son and I ended up developing, I, I knew that I was interested in changing career field, not out of physical therapy, but moving more toward pelvic health with my pregnancy itself. I was just more and more interested in, in women's health issues. And so I'd started already making the transition, starting to study for that type of coursework and the specializations that I'd need to do. And after I had my baby, I actually developed my own mild prolapse because I went for a run far too early, about three weeks postpartum, even though I knew better, but I was superwoman. You know, I, I could do it. My patients shouldn't do it, but I could do it. Right. Right. (laughs) But of course that was not the case. And so I did develop a mild bladder prolapse and I luckily had already started, you know, I'd really started studying and training for pelvic floor physical therapy. So I knew what to do. And I also knew what was wrong. And even though I went to my midwife and she said, you know, basically don't worry about it. It's, you know, 
I was like, no, this is a problem. And so I came up with my own program and really helped cure myself through my own stuff that I was doing with my patients. You know, I knew what to do with my patients. So I applied it to myself and I just had the belief and faith that I would get better. And I did. And so that was really sort of the fuel that kept me going in that direction. And then when I really started working specifically with just pelvic floor patients, I just fell in love because everyone who came to me always had the same story. They always basically said, I had no idea there was help for this type of thing. Why didn't anyone ever tell me this before? (laughs) Why does no one talk about this? And also the other thing I heard so often was like, this might be really gross or I'm embarrassed to tell you, but dot, 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 whatever they had to say. And always I was, of course, not gross. I mean, I'm like, girl, this is normal. Like this is actually really common. And just to see the light on their face as they realize that they're not alone was amazing. So, I mean, I, I I just, I get so many feels from remembering how it was in my early days, really waking up to how special it was to work with this population of patients. So that's how I got into pelvic floor physical therapy. So you saw what was happening with the elderly people. Yes. You know, I, I went to visit a friend who was in a um, assisted living, you know, it was a private facility and she was at the end of her life and she actually had really bad prolapse. That was mm-hmm. the first time I heard how horrible that is. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, nobody wants this to ever happen to them. Um, but so there's, you know, I guess muscle atrophy or whatever that can happen when you get really old. But then, you know, in addition to that, you know, we we come into this world and then we have a baby. And, you know, my first baby was eight, almost nine pounds. And it was like, a watermelon. <laughs> she was, she came out, she had rolls of fat. She was in six month clothes. She was real short and chubby. And it just, you know, I think it does a number on women, especially you have women that have had so many babies. So is it an issue that happens everything from, you know, birth, let's say having children in our twenties and thirties, all the way up to something that we deal with through our whole life and especially end of age, end of life. Oh gosh, yes. Pelvic health issues are, there's a spectrum of when issues can occur and, and, you know, different time periods, certain things are more um, prominent. They're more likely to occur at at certain periods, but these issues can occur at any point in Mm -hmm. life. And I've got to be honest with you, Katana, even young women, young athletes, teenage girls, a lot of them surprisingly have pelvic floor issues, uh, often, often bladder leakage, that kind of thing. It starts very young for some people. And it's just, again, it's just kind of laughed or, you know, glossed over brushed aside, not a big deal. Don't worry about it. It's just something people deal with. Oh, it just means you're working hard with, you know, more with the athletes. And then after you have your baby, um, it's very common to have leakage during pregnancy and postpartum. And actually, uh, there's research indicating that 50% of women who have been, who have had a baby have some degree of prolapse. So whether or not it's symptomatic, something that they really, that, that really impacts their quality of life is, you know, it may not, but there's some degree of prolapse in 50% of women. So that's a really huge number. And then one in three women have bladder leakage issues. And of course that gets, it does tend to get worse as people get older, uh, as we go through menopause and the hormones change, the estrogen decreases, and that makes the tissues, um, thin and, and be a little bit less, uh, you know, taut. And so that can lead to more risk of prolapse, also more risk of, uh, vaginal atrophy that can cause painful sex. All of these fall under the category of pelvic floor dysfunction. When you have pelvic pain, prolapse, bladder leakage, et cetera. And this can happen from teen years all the way up through, you know, the end of our life. Okay. And also I want to just quickly insert too, that I'm sorry to, to go on and on, but um, bladder leakage incontinence is actually one of the leading reasons that people actually have to go into uh, care facilities when they're older because they've lost their, their independence, their functional independence. So I think you, what I was going to say to you is I think you've gotten everybody's attention. Yeah. (laughs) It's a big 
deal. Well, and what my, I guess I get so fired up about this because like I, I, I heard this from a colleague of mine once and it just stuck in my head. She's like, we go to the dentist every year. Why don't we go to a pelvic specialist every year? I mean, these issues that I'm talking about are probably at least as common as cavities. I don't know. I don't have research on this. I know, but, but we, we don't want to talk about it. We don't yeah, want to talk but, about it. It's a secret. <laughs> exactly. But it's a secret. We can't talk about it. And it's, and it's just normal. Just brush it aside. But again, it's common, but it's not normal. And actually there's so much that can be done. Kind of like we go to the dentist to get our teeth cleaned for prophylactically, you know, for preventive dental care, but there's so much that we can do for preventive pelvic health care as well. It's just not talked about. Well, let's talk about two things. What are pelvic floor muscles? Okay. And then where are the pelvic floor muscles located, I guess? Because so let's yes. do the anatomy part. Perfect. We'll start okay. at the beginning. Yes. And um, so I do have a model, but I know that we're mostly radio, correct? Or should I? No, it's okay. That's fine. Okay. You can so I have my little pelvic too pelvis model here. <laughs> and okay. this shows all of the red shows where the pelvic floor muscles are located. So for anyone listening on the radio, basically, if you think of your pelvis, where you put your hands on your hips, even though your, your hips are actually lower than where you put your hands on your hips. But when you put your hands on that bony structure, that's your pelvis and the pelvic floor muscles are situated at the base of the pelvis. And they kind of are like a hammock that supports everything. So they support your pelvic organs from below. And they also close off, they, they help contribute to the sphincter control around your urethra, which comes from your bladder, so your pee hole, and also around your anus right here. So the muscles surround the sphincter of the anus and also the, the bladder, and they surround the vagina as well in women. Now, men and women both have pelvic floor muscles but they just look a little different in women versus men. Cause we have, first of all, women have a wider pelvis. The actual structure of the bony pelvis is wider than a male pelvis. And also we have an extra hole, essentially we have the vagina. So there's, there's, more, um, there's more flexibility in these muscles and that can allow for more problems to occur. So men do develop pelvic floor dysfunction but it looks a little different than female pelvic floor dysfunction. Mm -hmm. So I hope that explains kind of where it is, but basically they're again at the base of the pelvis and they're really, really closely connected. The pelvic floor muscles um, are really, really closely connected with the hip rotators and they even interdigitate. They sort of connect inward with the fascia, which is connective tissue mm -hmm. that hooks into the abdominals and also the back muscles too. And then at the top of all of this, so this is our core that we're talking about when we think of core fitness or core strengthening. We're actually talking about this whole canister and container of muscles in the center of our body where the pelvic floor is the bottom, the bottom of this core. And then we have our abs in the front and our back muscles in the, the back. And then we have the breathing diaphragm at the top. And so it's this whole connected team of muscles that actually are, are truly connected by fascia, connective tissue. So they really need to play well together for your body to be stable, your posture to be good. And actually, Katana, if you don't mind, I want to bring in your story a little bit here because you've mentioned about your, your back issues. And it's actually very common for um, back pain to have some pelvic floor dysfunction associated with it. And when you think about the fact that that pelvic floor is the base of the core, it's the center, it's the center piece <laughs> of the whole thing, really. And so I would, I would encourage you to definitely work on your pelvic health along with your other exercises. I'm sure your physical therapist gave you something for your pelvic floor, um, but I would definitely encourage that to be a part of your rehab program as well. Well, it's, you know, doing all the exercises they have me doing, it's amazing how number one, it got rid of the pain. Mm -hmm. you know, it's taken a month and a half though but it's gotten rid of the pain. And this is the thing I want to share with all the ladies is I went in originally because I said this pain is, you know, I just had the foot done and I think that was causing problems because I was so um, uneven because I couldn't put weight on this left foot. I finally had, and they had to putting two plates in my foot and that rehab was almost, that was three months. And so now my foot's not swelling. And yeah. so I really could start focusing on the back exercises. And then today they added some where I um, 
you know, pull my arms out in front of me holding, you know, from the side here, but I'm holding this thing and I'm, and I'm pulling it in. And I felt all the um, sides of me, um, the muscles tightening up. And so what you just said about those hip flexors and stuff, right? Oh my gosh, she's doing all these exercises and all of it is not only getting rid of my pain, but I can feel that core getting so much stronger. Yeah. yeah. And it's abs- so it, it absolutely is so aligned with the exercises that you have. Yes. Because yours combines that breathing and the yoga. And so, I mean, this is all, once you learn how to do it, it's really free. Oh, exactly. You can self-medicate. And, and, and so Dr. Bree, this is what I'm wondering. I was told, I, I hope this isn't weird for me to share, but when I had my baby that I have a tipped pelvis and I had an overactive uterus um, with spas with contractions um, when I would nurse <laughs> my husband's friend said, I've been looking for one of those for years. <laughs> When he told him his wife had an overactive uterus, I thought that was, I always um, laughed at that line, but I never really understood it, but I figured it was probably going to cause problems. And so what I find is I'm um, always in spasm. And so you're told to do these Kegels, but I'm thinking, I don't really, but your exercises were about relaxing which and this sounds good. So I want to sh- just bring that up. I'm sorry. I'm in, you know, bringing up so oh. much about my situation, but I think what you do is so important and revolutionary. I don't know anyone else who's doing this work the way you are. Oh, well, thank you for saying that. I, I have a very, um, I kind of go against the grain a little bit. Like for me, hearing that you have an overactive uterus and it goes into spasm easily things, you know, and, and of course you have this back pain, which usually is associated with tension and, you know, the, the leg length, the, the, the scoliosis and all of the things you have going on when tension is the, is, is the culprit, which it is in so many people, because here's an interesting thing about the pelvic floor. So again, it's at the very base of the pelvis, the floor of the core. And you think about the muscles that surround your, your, urinary area and your um, vagina and your anus and think about how when we get scared or when we have stress or anxiety uh this is an area that that tenses up reflexively like we don't even realize it but our butthole (laughs) tightens up you know things like that like oh and that happens and so what happens is if you already had some some tension potentially in that area some spasms tendency toward that And, you know, life is stressful. Let's face it. Most people carry a little too much tension in their pelvic floor. And so actually the last thing I would say for you is to go and do a bunch of kegels because that a kegel exercise is named after a a gynecologist, uh, Dr. Arnold Kegel from the, I believe, gosh, I think he was in the forties and fifties, I believe, but he pioneered a type of exercise where actually he had a device that he pioneered that helped measure the strength of contraction of the pelvic floor muscles. So he had people squeezing their pelvic floor muscles, squeezing and lifting, and then ultimately releasing. But the problem is that a lot of people do kegels wrong. They either are accidentally bearing down instead of squeezing and lifting, or they're squeezing and lifting, but never releasing. So it's like, they're kind of going like this all day long, just like, (laughs) <laughs> clenching these muscles and never actually letting them go, which is really, really important. Or they're sometimes squeezing their butt cheeks or their abs or something else is happening versus them doing it correctly. So I guess one thing that does set me apart is I start, I don't think kegels are bad. I think that they can be done very, very well for some people, but pretty much blanket statement almost everybody can benefit from learning actually how to relax those pelvic floor muscles first. So I really encourage people to, you know, ultimately we want you to be able to use your pelvic floor effectively and have it be a strong part of the inner core team that we talked about earlier. And, you know, I call it zipping up your core. So like for your exercises that you have, I like people to activate their pelvic floor first and then their low abs and they're nice and turned on through the core when they're doing whatever, twisting or whatever core moves they're doing. Can you tell us what that is? Because I love your program because you do say that. And then for someone like myself who has back problems, it reminds you, oh, I'm supposed to tighten my muscles before I bend down and pick something up. Yes. And you did the toothpaste thing. I remember otherwise, if you don't do it right. 
Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Great memory. Perfect. Yes. So, okay. So the pelvic floor is the floor of the core, as, as I've said a thousand times. So the pelvic floor is the base and we want to zip up. I call it. It's like you're zipping up a pair of skinny, high-waisted jeans, let's say, and you start that zipper down low at your pelvic floor. So you gently squeeze and everyone can try it right now. You gently squeeze and lift your pelvic floor muscles. Feel as if you're closing off your back passage, like you're stopping gas, like you're stopping wind or like you're stopping a fart or well, that is the same thing. So like you're closing off that area and then kind of bring that contraction, that squeeze and lift forward toward your urethra, your pee hole and your vagina area. So bring it forward, that squeeze and lift, like you're lifting up toward your head. It doesn't have to be super strong, but from there, we then want to move up into the abdominal area. So we start at the pelvic floor, this gentle squeeze and lift, and then kind of at the same time, but maybe a little after we gently pull in our low, low abs. So you can think of that area right above your pubic bone. Um, And if you go shh, like the SH sound, you can feel that area kind of turn on and pull in a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And so those muscles are very connected. The pelvic floor is very connected with the transversus abdominis, the deep ab muscles. So if you, if you activate them correctly in that fashion, pelvic floor first, then your low abs, you're really stable from the bottom up. And what happens there is then if you're doing something like something that increases intra abdominal pressure. So for example, lifting something or, you know, bending forward or twisting, it's not going to be like an uncapped toothpaste tube where the cap is off and you're squeezing around the middle of the toothpaste tube and all the toothpaste comes splatting out <laughs> because you've zipped up, you've started right. that, you've capped that toothpaste tube. So you're, you're good. And it, it helps you, of course, then there's a whole nother layer where you breathe in a certain way to help manage the intra abdominal pressure so that you're not having that huge buildup of pressure, but it really is important to zip up your core and also to breathe exhaling with exertion, exhaling as you do your crunch or exhaling as you do your twist or that kind of thing. And those things together will help you stay safe during your workouts and keep your pelvic organs in the right place (laughs) versus the toothpaste tube, you know, being uncapped. Wow. Yeah. Um, That's absolutely amazing (laughs) to, to hear you say that because I don't think that we've been taught no, no, you know, to zip up before we go lift something. And so we just bend over, we lift something. And then it's like, Oh, no, you know, that doesn't feel right. You know, yeah. it, and it actually doesn't feel right when, no. when you, you know, when you don't um, use your core properly, and then you lift, you know, and I had bad knees for years, and I know a lot of people do. And so you're afraid to bend with your knees. So you're even doing it worse because now you're using your back again, but you're not yep. using the core. Does that sound right? You've got it right on. And I mean, lift is actually the name of one of my, my signature program for prolapse and bladder leakage. And one thing that I talk about in that program is proper lifting, <laughs> because this is one reason so many women develop issues is they were not taught this information. Maybe we're told at some point when we were adults that, oh, you've got to be careful of your back when you're lifting, but nobody ever talks about the pelvic floor. And that's just as, I mean, it's, of course we want to protect our back health too, but the pelvic floor is very important and it's never addressed. So, you know, exactly what you said is, is perfect. Um, but if you don't mind, maybe I'll go back just a, a little step too, because yeah, we've been talking about the, like, strengthening and using your pelvic floor and your core correctly to activate it when you're exercising and lifting and that kind of thing. But before kind of going back to that idea of the thing that really would help everybody is actually learning how to relax and even just identify the pelvic floor muscles first, but also relax them because a lot of us to end up being too tense all day long in the pelvic floor. And if your muscles are constantly clenched, then they actually aren't going to work very well. You can't you know, they're, they're, they're just clenched. They're not actually functional. (laughs) So you need to learn how to relax them and let them go first so that then they can become functional so that then you can do a tagle exercise, or then you can zip up your core correctly. But if they're just constantly clenched, they're really not doing anything for you. First of all, they're exhausted. They're so tired. They're probably tender and tight and painful. And they're also not coordinated. They're not in control. They're not actually helping anything. And if you have prolapse, 
if you have a shift, which is a drop of your pelvic organs, a shift of your pelvic organs, then you have prolapse and your muscles are tight and tense. They're no longer supporting from below. They're actually tightening and squeezing around those shifted organs. So and pushing them out <laughs> and pushing them out further. Exactly. Like here goes the baby. Exactly. <laughs> but it's not the baby. It's you. <laughs> exactly. And so for the longest time, no matter what a person's pelvic floor issue was, what they had painful sex, or they had spasms in their bladder, or they had leakage, or they had prolapse or whatever, people would just say, well, go do kegels. But that's not, not a good place to start. So even for people who you'd think, well, that's a weakness issue. Like they have bladder leakage or they have prolapse. So that must be weakness. Like we can see how pain and, and tension might be from tightness, but from other issues that might seem like it would be more about weakness, actually relaxing first is really, really helpful because then after you've got that baseline established of being able to relax, then you can successfully strengthen. So I do have a question. I don't know if other gals, women, had their mother tell them, <laughs> you know, suck in your stomach. You should yes. walk around and sit always holding in your stomach, right? And then at yoga, I was told I'm supposed to stand my shoulders back and, um, you know, have a bit of a back curve. But then I always had my hips poor, you know, pushed forward. And I know I'm not the only one sitting here or listening to this going, yeah, I know I have, I've been told that, you know, like, are you supposed to have a back curve and let your stomach go out? Are you supposed to suck it in and push your pelvis forward? Are you supposed to suck in your gut? Because that seems like that would cause um, stress on the body, like, you know, um, tension, if you're constantly sucked in. And I'd like your opinion on that. Oh my gosh. You are, you're asking the best questions because these are the most common. These are the most common things. Oh, good, good. Bad, <laughs> improper lifting technique. Also poor alignment and poor breathing. These, a, a lot of these things are very, very mm -hmm. much contribute to, to pelvic health issues. And because they're the things that we do all day long, we lift things all day long. We, you know, transition from sit to stand all day long. We stand and, you know, hold our bodies in certain ways all day long. So what you're saying, first of all, if you're sucking in your belly, um, consistently, what that happens often, often happens there is that for one thing, your upper abdominals become really dominant. So again, think of that toothpaste tube, the uncapped toothpaste tube, and think about kind of squeezing around the middle. If your pelvic floor isn't strong from below and you're just sort of squeezing in your upper abs all day, cause you're sucking in, you know, kind of from the top, like kind of sucking in up, up high, not zipping up, you know, and, and to be honest, let me, let me backtrack a little bit there. I'm not wanting people to zip up actively all day long. I don't mean for anyone to think they need to go around clenching their pelvic floor muscles and in, in pulling in their low abs. That's, that's not what I mean. It's more for times of intensive activity, like core work, or if you're lifting something or moving a couch or a box or something like that, that's when you want to zip up. But in general, you don't want to zip up all day long. You certainly don't want to suck in your belly all day long either, because that's going to cause that upper abdominal dominance. And it causes an increase in intra abdominal pressure because you're squeezing around your upper abs and that's pushing all the pressure has to go somewhere. So it pushes down on your pelvic organs. And if your pelvic floor isn't strong, all of that pressure all day long is going to go somewhere. It's going to go down. So that's a real problem. And then the other problem where you, you mentioned kind of like um, you know, maybe thrusting your ribs forward a little bit. It's called a rib flare when you kind of thrust your ribs forward and, and really, you know, you want a lumbar curve, a little mm -hmm. bit of a lumbar curve in your low back, but if it's too much, or if your hips are thrust way forward, then that can overly stretch your anterior abdominal wall. So your, your abs, it overly stretches those muscles and they, as I said earlier, hook in to the pelvic floor. So first of all, it throws you out of alignment. And second of all, those muscles are overly stretched. They're not able to really fire and activate well. Your pelvic floor is hooked to them. So it's probably not firing and activating that well either. It's, it's all connected. And so really what people need to think about is not you know sucking in anything in particular. <laughs> it's, it's all about lining yourself up correctly. And so lining your body up in a way that everything is stacked and in alignment Nothing is thrust any which direction, particularly mm -hmm. you've got your feet 
are under your, your body. They're pointing straight ahead. You're, you're coming up on up through your hips. Your hips are back over your feet. They're not forward. So if you do stand and notice that your hips are way far over your toes, then that's a problem. You actually need to back your hips up so that they're over more, more over your heels even. And then going up from there, you want your rib cage stacked and lifted up over your pelvis. And if you think of it like a bell, like a bell with the ding donger pointing down yes. toward the ground, you want that ding donger pointing straight down toward the ground and not the bell tipping forward or back. So you want that bell nice and, and stable over your pelvis. Hmm. And you want your head over that rather than jutted forward. Like we do when we're at the computer or we're on our phones, mm -hmm. we want to pull our head back. So it's lifted over your ribs and you want your shoulders nice and open. Yeah. Wow. So it's, it's all about that alignment. And when you're in that alignment, you don't need, your muscles are in their perfect level of tone, the tone that they're supposed to be at to be able to turn a little extra on if they need to, but they're just at that beautiful level of resting tone. That's it's where it needs to be. Nothing's overly stretched. Nothing's overly contracted. It's just beautiful. So when we're standing, we don't have to suck in our stomach. We can no. just be... <laughs> You don't need to suck it in. <laughs> I don't know if anyone else was told that by their mother or an aunt or a loving grandmother, you know, but you know, and it's judgments on us that freak us out. And then we think, oh no, why did they say that? So I want to ask you also then, this probably leads into this idea of how our emotions and, you know, things we're thinking, things that, um, you know, we're always feeling we have to do, 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 and yep. not good enough. How, well, these emotions that are going on, it, how is, is that affecting the pelvic floor? And if so, what does it do? Oh my gosh. Okay. You're, I could talk about this forever, so I'll try to be brief, <laughs> but basically I actually think of bladder issues as an issue of, um, of, urgency and rushing and rushing and rushing. Like that's not only what happens in our bladder. We have this feeling of urgency and like, oh my gosh, like I can't make it to the bathroom on time, those kinds of things. But it also tends to happen when we're feeling that way in our life. Yeah. And with prolapse, prolapse is literally, you know, ph physiologically, it's an issue of too much pressure and not enough support. Mm. So too much pressure, like intra-abdominal pressure and not enough support from below, from the pelvic floor muscles. But if you take that exact thing that I just said and apply it to like emotional stuff too, it is literally too much pressure in our lives and not enough support. And we are just going and going and going. And we build up this tension in our bodies and this feeling that we need to just keep running and running and running and never take a break. And that also contributes to prolapse. So, I mean, on that level, there's emotional implications for our pelvic floor, this root of our body. And I, I, you know, the root chakra is, is associated with the pelvic floor and that chakra, if, you know, for people who are open to that type of thinking is, is all about security and, and safety and survival. And one of the reasons that, you know, we, we can feel under pressure, under the gun, under like, we just got to run and, and make, make ends meet and get things done is a root chakra imbalance. Mm. And there's pelvic floor imbalance going on too. And so that's one piece of it. The other piece of it is, as I mentioned earlier, the pelvic floor, it's a muscle of emotion. It's reflexive. As soon as you feel stress, fear, anxiety, again, root chakra stuff there, as soon as you feel any of those emotions, the first muscle, one of the first muscles to tense up is literally your pelvic floor. It, it tenses up without you even realizing that it's tensing up. That's just the way our bodies are built. And so um, that in itself, causes issues with excessive pelvic tension for many people, which is again, going back to that first thing that you can do to actually help yourself is usually taking some deep breaths and actually releasing the pelvic floor muscles. And there's lots of stretches that you can do to help with that. So give us an example then um, of how to do the, the breathing and the relaxing of the pelvic floor. Um, yeah. so is that something someone could do like right at their desk? Like, could we practice it right now? Like we can practice example? it right now. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I like to actually, I mean, for anyone who could do it lying down, it's really nice to do it lying down versus sit, sitting up or standing. But what you can think of is rather than breathing up high in your neck and your chest, because I mentioned at the beginning about how the, the core 
is, is all connected. We have the pelvic floor at the bottom, the breathing diaphragm at the top, and then we have our abs in the front and our back muscles in the back. So the top and the bottom of this core are the breathing diaphragm, which is kind of like an umbrella shaped muscle under your lungs. And then your pelvic floor is like a mirror of it on the, on the bottom and they move together surprisingly. So mm. you wouldn't think they'd be, you know, connected in that way, but they do. So when the breathing diaphragm comes down, when you inhale, so when you breathe in your lungs get bigger and the breathing diaphragm comes down, at least that's what should happen. Now, for most of us who tend to breathe really shallow up high in our chest, our breathing diaphragm isn't moving very much. It's kind of stuck. But that's not good because then our pelvic floor is kind of stuck too, because they work together. And so we want to bring our breathing down out of our neck and our shoulders and down into more into our belly and our lower ribs. And so when you do that, that also mobilizes the pelvic floor and allows it to do its job, which is to actually drop and descend a little bit and kind of receive the pelvic organs as the breathing diaphragm comes down. So they both come down together on the inhale. And then on the exhale, they both lift together. Now, so, when you do the exhale, do you do like, like a mini Kegel type of thing or does it just automatically do it? Great question. You can do it. So if you're just relaxed breathing, don't worry about adding a Kegel. Like don't, don't make it more than it needs to be because it's really just the muscles working together in their natural fashion. So inhale, you inhale into the belly and the ribs and everything softens and expands and releases. And then you exhale, your ribs come in, your belly comes in and your pelvic floor lifts too. So it's very, very gentle and very, very subtle. Now, if you want to make it more of an exercise, you can actually make it. You can, you can do, you can add a little oomph by doing a bit of a kegel exercise when you're doing your exhale. So you breathe in and you relax your pelvic floor, breathing into your belly and your lower ribs. And then you exhale and you feel your pelvic floor lift and your belly pull in. So you can make it more of an active, kind of like a mobilization type exercise. And then at the next level, if you're zipping up your core, <laughs> then you can inhale and then you can exhale and zip up your core as we talked about earlier. And then you can actually hold that gentle lift of the pelvic floor, the gentle kegel and your low abs pulled in. And then you keep breathing, but you breathe a little higher, not so down low into your belly, breathe a little higher because you're holding that zip up during the you know, set of abdominal crunches or the set of twists or this, whatever you're lifting or moving or that kind of thing. So you're still breathing, but you're actually engaged through that lower core and holding that tight. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so it's almost like that, you know, you get the feeling that you're zipping up those, you know, low waisted jeans, right? Exactly. Yep. <laughs> and they're right there. And then you're um, going to allow, keep your jeans on while you're working out, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Keep okay. your jeans on, but you don't want to, you don't want to hold your breath. You want to keep breathing. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Keep your jeans on though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's and exactly you, right. You can imagine that you're keeping that, um, you know, for the exercise. So yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what, what do you suggest for all of us that are just, you know, living this, this life of lots and lots of stress, yeah. you know, so like, is there a little workout we can do in the, do you, you know, should we do a little workout in the morning and then, you know, breathing, special breathing and relaxing during the day? And, um, you know, do, should we do it a couple of times a day or is one time? Okay. Like, what do you suggest for us to do? Well, so Again, I could talk about this for hours. So it's just a few, like one suggestion I would give everybody, because again, I do think that the relaxation ends up being something that's really important for everyone. And so I love suggesting to people to do hips up time is what I call it. Hips up time. Uh, you know, in the afternoon, if you can, around three o'clock PM is wonderful, uh, you know, three o'clock, four o'clock, five o'clock, whatever. By that time of the day, a lot of us have had quite a bit of pressure on our pelvic floor muscles. Like we've been standing or sitting all day long and we've got a lot of downward pressure on those. If we have prolapse, then, because again, remember up to 50% of women who've given birth do have some degree. And so you might feel a little heaviness or dragging sensation in your pelvis. And so lying down on your back in kind of a supported bridge position. So your feet are under your are on the floor and they're under your knees and you lift your, your bum up off the ground and you put some pillows underneath your bottom and then you just rest your hip down, hips down on the pillows. So you're supported. You're not 
holding that bridge position. You just relax, totally relax into it. But your hips are actually elevated. Is that making sense how that would look? Yeah, and I remember one of the exercises you actually had us do like butterfly legs and then yes. come back. Oh, does that feel so feels good? So good. And so from that hips up position, you can just let your knees kind of flop apart and just relax, not even move them. And, and in that position, you can just breathe into your pelvic floor and calm your mind and body, relieve that pressure on your pelvic floor. Because basically when your hips are up on pillows, gravity kind of pulls your pelvic organs back into their rightful place. If you do have any oh, that's good. Yeah. shifting. Yeah. So gravity pulls everything back into place and you can open your pelvic floor muscles by flopping your knees apart and just relaxing. So that's one great exercise. Just staying there for three minutes and in the afternoon, every single day is something I actually try to do myself. Um, but then if you want to do some strengthening on top of that, you can do that exact same position that we just were talking about and do what you said, Katana, and you can then have your knees apart and then you can just exhale, breathe out and bring your knees together and feel your inner thighs activate and your pelvic floor muscles kind of fire up and even your low abs fire up as you exhale and bring those knees together and then inhale, let them flop apart and then exhale, fire up that center line, bring them together. That in itself is a really beautiful, gentle exercise that kind of gets things firing without having to do a basic, you know, a kegel. And so it prepares women for mm -hmm. their next job, which is finish up at work, whatever you're trying to do for the work, right? The day job exactly. and then you have to, um, come home and whatever your life is, you might be running kids around or preparing a dinner or getting ready to do something else. I mean, and a lot of us work at night on Zoom or something like that, but it seems like that that could actually prepare you for really, that evening without bringing the stress home with you. Really nicely said. And it gives your muscles that break that it needs because most of us don't take this break and we just push through, push through, push through. And our, just think of your poor pelvic floor. It's like all day long, I'm on and I'm working for you. I'm supporting everything. I'm the centerpiece where everything hooks in. Essentially, I'm doing all of this and you never give me a break. And so how am I supposed to continue the entire day without that little tender love and care, you know, break in the afternoon or whenever you can fit it in. I know that it's not possible for everyone to lie on their office floor, but you know, if you can find a way to just take a, take some pressure off and breathe and relax those muscles. Uh, it's really, really helpful. Well, if you're not in a cubicle and you can shut a door, <laughs> yeah. I'm all for it. <laughs> yeah, Or if you have a van, like I remember at one point when <laughs> the kids were young, we had a van with, I think a double or queen size bed in the back, you know, that turned into a seat. I guess it was probably a double bed, <laughs> but you could go out and um, yeah, it is tough if, if you're at work, you know, mm -hmm. to try to find some private, but a lot of people are working from home. And so maybe that's a good idea to go take a little break. And that's what I was thinking, you know, take that break during the day for yourself. So what about, um, how can, can you help, help us with some ideas for exercises, meditation or breath work to prepare us for intimacy at night so we can be, you know, receptive and, and cause I know, um, it's funny, there's the moon cycles too, that we deal with. And those really mm -hmm. affect whether you're the purring cat or the, you know, yes. <laughs> stay away. <laughs> And so um, I'm thinking if you're carrying all that tension around in your body and then you just got done taking care of dinner and dishes and cleaning up and now, you know, you want to really get into a relaxed mood. Do you have some suggestions there as far as like a little breath work or routine that can prepare you so you can do yeah. Isn't oh that my sound God. exciting? <laughs> Such a great question. Well, first of all, the exact same you know, set of the, the relaxation and any really? that like, butterfly thing would be great for that because we want, when we're getting ready for intimacy, we don't want to be stressed about the bills or the dishes or the whatever. We want to be in a relaxed uh, parasympathetic state, not that sympathetic fight or flight. We want to be in the rest and digest state or in another way to 
call it is the feed and breed state <laughs> for the parasympathetic yes. nervous system. Oh, feed and breed, cute. Feed and breed. <laughs> yeah, we want to be in that state. And so just relaxing, taking some deep breaths, like we talked about before, into your pelvic floor, into your belly, exhaling double the amount of the inhale. So if you inhale for four counts, you exhale for eight counts. And that really calms the nervous system, which is huge. And so just doing that with your hips propped up on pillows, or maybe even in kind of like a frog stretch where your legs are up and your, your feet are apart and you're holding onto your feet. That's hard to describe, but just, you know, something relaxing for the pelvic floor is a great way to prepare. Um, the other thing that you can do is meditation. I actually do have some pelvic floor meditations and I just heard from a friend for, for the same reason of what I just mentioned, kind of calming the mind and body. I just heard from a friend that she's been doing these meditations and she said, I don't know if this is TMI, but my sex life has like skyrocketed since I've been doing these meditations. Okay. How do we sign up for your meditations? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> well, actually I, I do have a program that's available only through the end of this month, but maybe we can talk about that later. It's meditation for prolapse and pelvic health. And basically you're doing some, um, you're, you're, you're breathing. You can be in any position seated, like a seated meditation or lying down lying down with your hips on pillows, whatever you like. And I, I offer various guided meditations where you're just breathing into that area, often envisioning like white light in your pelvic floor and just envisioning kind of these sensations of light and love <laughs> into this part of your body. And it just, you know, where the focus and attention goes, the energy flows. Yes. And so literally you're going to be bringing yeah. circulation, blood flow, health, vitality to that area. And so meditation in that way can be very helpful for intimacy. Oh, that's awesome. And I have one more suggestion too, if we have time for it, it's a quick one. And I want you to tell us about your programs too, because we're, yeah. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Well, one more quick suggestion that can also help with intimacy and just pelvic health and strengthening and relaxing is hip circles, which is one of my favorite exercises to teach people. And that's where you actually can do it anytime. Even if you're at work, just go to the bathroom and go into the stall and circle your hips around. So it's like you're drawing a circle on the ground beneath you. And as you circle your hips around forward, you can think about doing a kegel, lifting your pelvic floor, pulling in your, your abs. And then as you circle your hips around back, okay. you can think about releasing the pelvic floor muscles, letting them go, feeling your sitting bones kind of widening apart, your butt bones kind of widening apart and your pelvic floor just releasing. So. For anyone who can see me, you're just literally making your um, upper body is still and you're circling your hips uh, on the ground beneath you. <clears throat> so you're standing and it's like you're drawing a circle on the ground beneath you with your pelvis. Right. And your head and shoulders are very still and you can take it slow. But again, you release your pelvic floor muscles on the way back. And then on the way forward, as you swing your hips forward, you lift your pelvic floor, pull in your low abs and you can even exhale. So take it real slow and go maybe five or 10 times one direction and then go five or 10 times the other direction and do that a couple of times a day. And it just wakes things up. It mobilizes your hip joints and your low back. It's great for you. Great for your body. And it's very um, stimulating for the, that part of your body, which will ultimately help with your sex life. This is so exciting. I'm sure everyone listening is so excited. So hip circles, hip circles. <laughs> yes, yes. So I'm going to make sure that um, I want you to share how people can engage with you. You're all over YouTube. They'll yeah. catch you that way. Remember, at, just go to joinsmartwomen.com. You'll be invited to the Smart Women's Academy where they can come in and go to the Smart Women resource area. And I know there we have a 10-day program, which is amazing. It's a great introduction to all the these things, but then you do ongoing classes. Like you just mentioned a meditation class. You've got a, don't you have a lift coming up? Yeah. So I have, um, a meditation course, which is only available through the end of June, but it's called elevate and it is available through the end of June right now for, uh, listeners right now, but I, that course is meditation for prolapse and pelvic health. It's a very low price intro court. It's so fun. It's got guided meditations for seven days and a little workout that goes with each day as well. Plus journal prompts to help mm. you get in touch with this part of the body and, uh, just learn how to move your body in a way that's safe for your pelvic floor. 
Um, so that's called Elevate. And then and we go, what's the website you'll want them to come to? Um, if you go to, it's a bit.ly is the easiest way. So bit.ly slash fem elevate, F-E-M-E-L-E-V-A-T-E. That okay. is that course. And then my signature program is called Lift. And that is a five week course that actually is, is longer than that because there's a ton of bonus content and et cetera. But it's a five week program that helps teach you exactly a guided step-by-step -step progression if you have prolapse and bladder leakage to help support you. It starts with relaxation, of course, it starts with relaxation. And then we move through a, a series of exercises that helps you get stronger through your pelvic floor and the rest of your core to support your pelvic organs. And lifestyle is a huge part of that program. So how you lift, how you poop, how you pee, how you transition from sit to stand is all covered. The clothes you wear, yeah. all of that actually matters in your prolapse. And so I cover all of that step-by-step -step in, in the lift program. Unbelievable. That's very comprehensive. It well, is. We, we are at the top of the hour. Oh no, <laughs> we could, I know we could talk forever. So, <laughs> but what is the, your main URL? Is it your name? It's femfusionfitness.com. So everything femfusionfitness.com. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Well, I definitely want people to go visit you there. They can Google you on YouTube. They yeah. can come to Smart Women's Academy and that's yeah. at joinsmartwomen.com. So Perfect. thank you so much. This is just so much information You're and welcome. useful help, useful help. Well, and I just want to remind everyone to relax their pelvic floor and dance more. And there you go. You're going to be oh. healthy. <laughs> and you're going to have more sex. <laughs> yeah. Enjoy. <laughs> oh, great. This is wonderful. Thank you so much. And next you're week we have, or next, in two weeks, our next show, we have Dr. Keisha coming on. She'll be talking about these hormones for all ages. And until our next show, go out and live with more purpose, passion, and prosperity. Thank you for joining us here at Smart Women Talk Radio, a place to learn, prosper, and grow. Tune in again next week for another exciting episode of Smart Women on the CTR Network. And remember to live with purpose, passion, and prosperity.